All right, great. Now we can begin our Intercultural for Understanding Virtual Symposium, um, organized by Global Youth Philanthropy, but hosted by me, David Cho. Anyways, so our agenda for today is first of all, I would like everyone to introduce themselves in the chat, and it would be ideal if you guys turned your cameras on out of respect for both me and the presenter. So we're not talking like black screens. But anyways, yeah, I would like you guys to introduce yourselves in the chat and just follow this template. Like say if you're like a student or a parent, or if you're a student, like if you're like a college student or like a high school student from wherever you guys are from. So we can see uh, where our audience is coming from today. And then I'll do a short introduction on the organization that helped um, organize this entire thing, Global Youth Philanthropy and Youth for Intercultural Understanding Virtual Symposium as a whole. Then we'll move on to what you guys all came for, the presentation from our guest speaker, Malika. And then we'll have a discussion with questions and answers because I'm sure most of you guys will have uh, some questions during the presentation. But yeah, before we begin, can we get some introductions and you guys to turn on your cameras? That'd be great. Also, yeah, um, it would be great if you guys meet yourselves as you're joining the meeting. So we don't have any um, unwarranted interruptions. All right, great. Anyways, moving on. So the mission of Global Youth Philanthropy, it is a nonprofit organization and it is President's Volunteer Service Award certified. What this means is GYP, Global Youth Philanthropy, helps youth turn their passion and ideas into innovative philanthropic projects through coaching and connecting them to needed resources. Now we acknowledge that a lot of people have great ideas, but they don't have the resources or the connections to get them finished. So Global Youth Philanthropy helps them to achieve their passions and goals. And it helps young students gain larger world perspectives and leadership through volunteering experiences and um, learning about like other people's perspectives in general, like what we're doing today. And then last but not least, it promotes communication and collaboration amongst youths, similar to what I'm doing and uh, my uh, friends and co-hosts like Malika are doing today. Moving on. So the objectives and impacts of global youth philanthropy and like youth uh, intercultural understanding symposium is it provides opportunities for youths to familiarize themselves with the diverse cultures and traditions around the world. It promotes respect, understanding and appreciation for cultural diversity and it builds human connections, communication and compassion and it helps develop an intercultural competence global citizenship and leadership towards a culture of peace. And keep this in mind that it happens every month. So there's 12 per year, obviously, but I'll give you guys a minute to scan the QR code if you guys are not already part of the group. Also, um, I strongly recommend you guys join the group because it is an easy way to get connected and be aware of the latest events hosted by GYP, but specifically for the Intercultural Symposium. Moving on. So the objectives and impacts for um, the symposium continued is all of the student participants receive a GYP certificate of participation for cultural competence and you get to submit and publish your reflections slash opinions on blogs to share around the world for everyone around the world from like China, like America to see. And you can become guest speakers at future symposiums where you can have the opportunity to share your culture as well. Anyways, so yeah, as you can see here on the bottom right, that's a certificate of participation. Uh, it looks great on like a resume. It looks great on like an application. And I strongly recommend you guys give this a shot. Moving on. And yeah, that is the email. If you have any questions, feel free to just shoot us an email and we will respond within like 24 hours. Anyways, yeah. Now moving on to uh, membership of GYP student clubs. The prime membership of GYP student clubs is $150 annually. So $150 for 12, uh, 12 months, that's like not that much. And if you want more chances to practice English, 
and do more student volunteering, we strongly recommend you guys to become a member of GYP student clubs. And I'm well aware that most of you guys come from like um, backgrounds that, uh, my bad, you come from backgrounds that in which like English isn't your first language. This is a great opportunity to actually practice your English, which is like an important skill to have. And like, if you're applying for like a job or like some education institutions, uh, you're guaranteed three or more admissions in global youth philanthropy, short training courses are in either debate, history, or graphic design, or others. Me personally, I dabble in um, teaching or volunteering a little bit in debate and history, and it is a great opportunity to meet like other like-minded people, and not only educate yourself, you have the opportunity to educate others, and you get better access to GYP student activities like mock debates intercultural seminars, student leader positions, and more. And once again, this all looks great on like a resume and application. And if you like, uh, if you participate in debates, this is a great opportunity to learn and also uh, practice among other talented youths. Uh, it is, you're also eligible to apply for GYP's volunteer award and PVSA, which I'll talk about later. And please help GYP to promote this program because um, yeah, Global Youth Philanthropy does a lot of like, um, free stuff so this is like one of the ways of funding global youth philanthropy moving on so global youth philanthropy boston is one of the branches of gyp and it is an educational nonprofit registered in massachusetts in march 2020 and gyp boston has a 501c3 u.s federal tax exhibition status and GYP Boston is also a certifying organization for president's volunteer service award pvsa which i will once again, talk about later. And then GYP Boston is a nonprofit partner of the Boston Government Youth Engagement and Employment Program. So once again, yeah, GYP does a lot of things for our youth, for example, like helping them get employed, which is a big part of like every team's life. Yeah, and once again, I'll pause for a minute for you guys to scan the QR code. All right, moving on. So the PVSA award, many of you guys are probably wondering what that is. And GYP Boston is an official certifying organization for the President's Volunteer Service Award. Now, uh, unfortunately, PVSA does not accept applications from individuals. So what this means is no matter how good you are, as long as you're not like, uh, my apologies, as long as you're not nominated by like a group like GYP, they won't like even look at your um, application. But look, Luckily for us, GYP is one of these certifying organizations. So Global Youth Philanthropy can apply for the PVSA or the President's Volunteer Service Award to our uh, for our students' volunteers. So I think it's safe to say that it's like a no-brainer. This looks great on like any resume or any application because it's like the President's Volunteer Service Award, which is like a highly contested and highly... Um, reputable source and like a word and pvsa applicants must be at least five years old which i'm sure most of you guys if not all of you guys are and must be u.s citizens or green card holders now global youth philanthropy yearly volunteer hours counting period is from october 1st to september 30th of the following year so anytime during this time span uh if you volunteer that gets clocked uh, and you that contributes to your chances of being nominated for the pvsa so GYP Volunteer Award is another award that you can receive if you participate in GYP activities. So the trademark of the GYP Volunteer Award and its logo are registered in the states of Massachusetts once again. And it has similar standards to PVSA, but accepts applicants worldwide. You know how I said um, one slide back when if you apply for the PVSA award, you must be like a US citizen or green card holder, which I understand uh, many of you guys aren't, including me. So this award is kind of like same standards as PVSA, but it accepts applicants worldwide. Now, the applicants must be registered with GYP Boston for at least six months in advance, and each candidate will have a mentor, which is good gyp volunteer award candidates must send a gyp volunteer hour summary every three years so we get to see who volunteers the most and spends the most time on these events and just who contributes the most to their global community and uh intercultural symposium and debate club is two of the 
clubs and events that I am very fond of and I participate very uh, much in. So the GYP Intercultural Symposium is a unique program that fosters inclusivity, diversity, and global awareness among the youth. So for example, right now we're doing the Iranian culture and Japanese culture in the summer of 2023, which that we might add more or we might change, but GYP Boston Debate Club is a regular entry-level debate skills classes with debate practice classes and seminars and exchange events with international schools worldwide. Now, what we mean by regular entry-level debate skill classes is we teach classes all the way if you're like, if you don't even know what the word debate means. So like if you're like a you know, seasoned and experienced debater. So yeah, no matter how good you are, like don't feel like don't be afraid or intimidated by debating and participating with other debaters. Moving on. A GYP Publication Club and re Research Essay uh, Writing. So um, I think it's safe to say once again, that if you like publish a book or if you have like a writing that's published, that looks great on like a resume or application to any school. And GYP's first ebook, Mosaic, will be published by the end of 2023. So I'm assuming anywhere around September to December. And students with graphic design skills, organization skills, and writing skills are welcome to join the GYP Publication Club, where you guys can actually contribute to these books that will be published, which, first of all, is like great practice if you want to dabble in like writing or designing later on in your life. But it's also like it looks great on like a resume that you help contribute to a book that got published and science focused student research essays and GYP second ebook. So students can actually research on like environments and sustainability will be the key of part like the will be the key part of the second GYP's ebook. So the second ebook actually um, like takes research done by like students and students research writing program will be launched in the late part of 2023. All right, so moving on to the, what I'm sure most of you guys are here for today, moving on to our guest speaker, Malika. She is an Iranian rising junior who likes drawing, reading, and music. Um, I'm very excited for this presentation, which I'm sure many of you guys are. So without further ado, I'll pass the mic to Malika. Malika, are you here? Can you hear me? Uh, could you put your mic closer to your mouth? I don't have one. You don't have one? Okay. Um, yeah, it works. Just make sure if you are not presenting, uh, keep your mic muted. And also, if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to type them in the chat, and we will answer them later in the discussion and Q&A period. Thank you very much. Yeah, Malika, uh, you can take it away. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Persian or Iranian culture presentation. Uh, I hope you'll enjoy your time here. So what we're going to be going over today in order is just like a small little history crash course, because history is generally really important to Iranian people. So I figured that would be important to mention to you guys, even if it's just like the most important bits. After that, we'll be going over some pretty important historical sites, some cool tourist attractions, a bit about general life here in Iran, and, and a bit about some popular foods uh, in the area. So the first thing we'll be going over is the Achaemenid Empire which was founded by Cyrus the Great. It's, it had a really well-established administration. It was really powerful in terms of finances, language, and it had a really powerful military. And because of this, it was really well-known for its feats of war, especially in conquering lands such as Phoenicia, Cyprus, Egypt, Libya, Cyrene, Barca, Kush, and Macedonia, as well as many more. Next, we'll be going over the Parthian Empire, which was founded by Arcasis I. It's most well known for its rivalry with Rome. As the Parthians were expanding their territory westward, they came into contact with the Roman Republic, which led to many disputes between the two. 
neither were completely able to conquer the other, which is mostly because the Persians were unskilled in siege warfare, while the Romans had a pretty good idea of it, as well as Persian archers and cataphracts, specifically the Parthian shot, which is basically when horseback archers would fake or make a real retreat and turn around to fire arrows at the enemies. These tactics basically canceled each other out, so neither were able to completely conquer the other. Next, we're going over the Sasanian Empire, which founded by Ardashir I. His goal was to rebuild the empire built by Cyrus the Great during the Achaemenid Empire. It's mostly well known for influencing the world with their arts, as well as revitalizing Zoroastrianism. It's influenced arts such as just visual arts, architecture, music, literature, and philosophy in many areas especially in areas such as Asia, Eastern Europe, and some parts of Africa. So next we have the Umayyad Caliphate, which was the first ruler of this caliphate was Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. And this, this dynasty was most well known for the spread of Arabic and Islam, as well as the Muslim conquests, which we're not going to go over in much detail. Islam becomes a lot more available to non-Arabs in terms of before the Umayyad Caliphate, non-Arab Muslims didn't really have a lot of rights in that the Arabs believed, believed that as the original Muslims, they like owned it, I guess. But either way, Islam becomes much more available to non-Arabs. And Arabization leads to a language shift, especially in, in the modern Iran area, where Old Persian becomes Arabic. To go over the Abbasid Caliphate. Al-Mansur uh, was basically the first ruler, and he founds Baghdad, which ends up becoming the new capital. It's marked by the major rule of Persian bureaucrats, which are called Buids, and Seljuk Turks. It's most well known for its battles with the Byzantine Empire. After a while of the initial battles with the Byzantine Empire, Empress Irene of the Byzantine Empire demanded peace. And after that, they had a peace treaty for a bit. And then afterwards, a future Byzantine emperor broke the peace treaty, leading to more war. The Safavid Empire, which was founded by Ismail I, is considered to be the beginning of modern Persian history because of its general region, as well as the like popularization of Shia Islam. It's also the beginning of the unrest with the Ottoman Empire. After the Ottoman Empire found out that the Safavids were recruiting Turkmen tribes for the Safavid army, they saw them as a threat and began de deporting Shia Muslims. And this led to the Shahkulu Rebellion, which was a pro-Shia Saf uh, and Safavid rebellion against the Ottoman Empire. This will cover the Qajar Empire, which was founded by Muhammad Khan Qajar, which is where it gets its name from. Over the course of roughly 100 years, from I believe around 1800 to the 1900s, the importation and exportation grew exponentially, essentially, which led to like financial stability, which led to war because that's what happens. So Iran loses land to Russia in the Russo -Per in the Russo-Persian Wars. And these lands are basically modern day Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. Next, this is the most recent era and technically the last one after or before the modern era. So this is the Pahlavi era. Reza Shah was declared the leader after Ahmad Shah of the Qajar Empire was weakened by a military coup. Reza Shah formally asks others to call the country Iran. And the difference between Iran and Persia, which I know many people are not aware of, is that Iran is the endonym, which means that it, Iran is the word that is referred to the country by the natives here while Persia is the exonym, which is what people outside of the nation call it. And 
One of the most major things during this era was the White Revolution, which was basically just rapid modern modernization. And one of the major points of this is that women get the right to vote. However, the Pahlavi era was ended by the Islamic Revolution. So our first historical site is the Kaha Sadabad, which was initially built in the Qajar era, but it was expanded for Reza Shah in the Pahlavi era. It is absolutely massive and there's no other way to, to describe it. It is nearly like I believe 1 million square meters or something. I don't know the exact, but it's absolutely huge. After the Islamic Revolution, it basically just became a museum complex. Uh, I've been to a few of the museums, but I'm not sure exactly how many there are in there. However, the ones that I've been to are the Melat Museum, which the building of the Melat Museum is the former residence of Reza Shah and his family, which is basically just preserved to see your, their house. The next museum is the Museum of Fashion, which is the museum of art. And Fashion was basically just a famous artist. And then there's also the uh, Royal Clothes Museum. Our next historical site is the Takht Jamshid, which is the ceremonial capital of the Achaemenid Empire, which means it's not technically the capital, but it's so important that people basically consider it the capital. It's also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And basically what this means is that it's a protected area that is culturally or naturally important to the history of human uh, humans as a whole. This, uh, the Takhta Jamshid specifically is culturally important. Built by the command of Darius the first, uh, the, he used the palace of Susa as a reference and this entire, it's basically a castle complex. It was built out of gray limestone. And eventually, unfortunately, it was destroyed by Alexander I and his conquests uh, with fire, presumably. Sargad is uh, the capital of the Achaemenid Empire while it was under the rule of Cyrus the Great. And the capital stayed there until Darius moved it to Perspolis. Uh, it's also a UNESCO World Heritage Site, also culturally. It's considered to be the tomb of Cyrus the Great, which you can see in the middlemost and rightmost image. It's also uh, somewhere inside the complex. It is also considered to be the tomb of Cambyses II, which I believe was Cyrus the Great's son. So our first tourist attraction we'll be going over is the Burj Milad, which many of you know as specifically the Milad Tower. It's the first telecommunication tower, and it's the sixth tallest tower in the world, as well as the 24th tallest general structure in the world. It's part of the Trade and Convention Center in Tehran, and it was built after the Islamic Evolution because it was built, it was built because the government wanted a new symbol for Tehran instead of the Azadi Tower, which was used as the symbol of Tehran during the Pahlavi era. And since they wanted to distance themselves from the Palavia, they decided to build the Burj Milad instead. Parke Abu Atash is our second tourist attraction. It's also relatively large. Its name literally means the water and fire park, in which Ab means water, O means and, and Atash means fire. Uh, in the park, there's a section dedicated where there's specifically like water fountains or sprinklers that you can see on the bottom left of the middlemost image. Uh, children generally play in them, but if you don't want to, there's a bunch of air, uh, space around it where you can walk up past them without getting wet. And as you can see in the rightmost of the center image, there are huge towers that produce fire basically at every hour. And as far as I'm aware, there's no risk of getting hurt. There's also the Gomba de Mina Planetarium, which unfortunately I could not find a picture for, but that's also in the park and it's very cool. And uh, built off of the park is also uh, a bridge called the Kola Tabiat, which we'll be going over now. So the Pola Tabiat, which just means Tabiat Bridge, is the largest pedestrian bridge in Tehran, which is roughly 270 meters. It's built over the Modares Highway, which uh, in the rightmost image you can see at like the center leftish part of the image. 
It's been designed to connect Tabiat, or it's been designed to connect Park Abatash and the Talakani Park. Uh, Tabiat means the nature park, which you can see in the rightmost image. The column that is holding up the bridge is supposed to look like a tree, which is where it gets its name from, the nature bridge. It was finished in 2014, I believe, and uh, there's a bunch of restaurants and kiosks and stuff like on either end of the bridge. And it's generally just a very pretty sight, especially at night when the lights turn on. So now that we're going to go over general life, I feel like things may be getting a little more relatable for you guys. Tehran, at least, is basically similar to any other city in the U.S., Canada, wherever. However, a major difference in Iranian and uh, U.S. culture is that, or generally Iranian and everywhere else in the world culture, is that weekends here in Iran are considered to be Thursdays and Fridays instead of Saturdays and Sundays. Another cool thing I find about the city is that traffic lights here have little timers on them, so you can tell when the lights are going to turn green or red or whatever. Another kind of like culture shock for people that I've told about this place is that indoor malls are pretty minimal here. Their most recently added uh, one is the Iran Mall, but otherwise most malls are just like outdoor plazas. Uh, also, another sort of like culture shock is that people often just stay awake super late to go on late night picnics, which I think is pretty cool because in the U.S. people generally are like, I should sleep early because I have work tomorrow. But here, people just go out and have fun basically whenever. So another cool thing about Iran is that parks have free exercise gear that anyone can use, children, adults, elderly, whoever. And you can see it on the rightmost side of the picture. Uh, basically, anyone can use them. It's very cool. Also, parks are not defined the same way as the U.S. defines parks. As in, the U.S. generally defines parks where there's like a playground. But here, parks can basically be anything as long as someone calls it a park. Also, another big difference between parks in the U.S. and um, here in Iran is that most parks here have like souvenir shops and even like food stores everywhere. And you can just like, if you're at the park, you can just go grab like a snack if you want, which I think is pretty cool. Huge difference in Iran, in uh, Iranian culture and US culture is that Iran has a lot of what we call bazaars, which are basically just areas indoor or outdoor that are designed for stores or shops. Uh, some of the most major ones that I've uh, been to are the Grand Tehran Bazaar and the Grand Isfahan Bazaar, which is the one in the picture. It's always crowded, even on weekdays. You could go on the train to the Bazaar station and you would be absolutely squished in there, which I think is pretty cool. So every bazaar is also different, but they all have like a similar gist to them in which it's a large collection of stores so a lot of them are family owned or small businesses, which I think is really cool. And they sell a bunch of different things that you can't really see in the picture because I took a, a picture of the, like the clothing area, but they sell foods there. They sell like handmade items, art, like daily necessities, shampoo, shower stuff, towels, jewelry. Even sometimes they sell live animals, generally small chickens, ducks, or like uh, quails. And in my opinion, it's a very uh, cool thing because a lot of people can make a lot of income from having a store in the bazaar. Another pretty cool thing I think about the like the culture, quote unquote, of Iran is that there's a lot of stray cats here. And I think it's just really cool. Everywhere you go, you can basically see a cat. Some people feed them. Some people are scared of them. People have mixed opinions. And personally, I'm not really sure why there's so many strays, but I have a hunch that they were allowed to populate with minimal disturbance because Prophet Muhammad liked cats and he preferred them. So people generally left them alone because, well, he liked them and people want to please the Prophet. So that's, they left them alone, which led to cat population goes up. So now we'll be going over popular foods. 
The first one we'll be going over is called chole kebab, which as you can see in the picture is a kebab with or like a skewered meat with rice, grilled tomatoes, limes, assorted vegetables, basically anything. Uh, it's a very loose definition. Uh, there's different types of kebab as well. The most major ones are kubide, which is in the pic in the picture, which is um, usually lamb or beef mixed with herbs and then skewered to make the meat. And then there's also a kebab bag, which is lamb or beef, usually filet mignon beef. And there's also another kind of kebab called juje, which is chicken with bones or boneless, also just grilled, served with or without rice. Also, something cool I like to think about is that you don't have to eat it with rice. You can, in, at basically any restaurant, you can order it with no rice. And instead, they'll give you like a plate of bread to like eat it with the bread instead. The next food we'll be going over is asheshte, which I like I like uh, how it's named because ash means like a soup. Usually it refers to like thicker soups that have like, that are more viscous. And reshte means noodles, which, so the name ends up meaning basically just a thick noodle soup, which is pretty cool. It's basically like noodles, like cooked wheat noodles in a soup base of like a lot of herbs, beans, garlic, onions, and kashk, which is a sour dairy product. I, I also think it's cool because it's vegetarian and it can even be made vegan by simply just not adding the kashk. It's also absolutely like ancient as far, like as far as I'm aware, it dates back to like at least like a thousand years. And it's evolved a lot since then, which I think is really cool. So the next food we're going over is abgusht, and the name quite literally means water meat because ab means water and gusht means meat. As you can see in the picture, it's generally made with lamb or beef, although in the picture it's made with beef. Uh, it also generally has chickpeas, beans, onions, potatoes, tomatoes in it. It also has a lot of turmeric and also just generally herbs because everything is better with herbs. Also a cool thing about this dish is that the solids can be separated from the water, like strain, and the solids can be mashed to make gusht kubide, which means like mashed meat, and it also tastes pretty good. There's, it's also a very cool recipe because it's really flexible. You can basically put any kind of bean in it, you can use any kind of lamb or beef for it, and you can also substitute like the different amounts of ingredients you use. You can make it with minimal meat, you can make it with a bunch of meat, and I think that's pretty cool. So the next food we'll be going over is called shirin polo, which the name literally means sweet rice, because shirin means sweet and polo means rice. Although many people here also call it wedding rice, because it's popularly served at like weddings and like special events in general. The most main ingredients in it are rice, obviously, oranges, uh, which hence the sweet in the name, uh, chicken, pistachios, rose water, carrots, saffron. Sometimes you can add sugar to make it sweeter if that's what you prefer. You can also add almonds. Uh, also, barberries are sometimes used to add like sweetness and sourness to it. And it's also pretty cool because there's many versions of it, like. You can basically substitute the amounts of ingredients in it. You can add minimal of something, a lot of something, which goes for any recipe. But I think it's pretty cool that for this specific one, literally anything works. Like you could literally take out some of the, like the ingredients and it would still be shirin polo, like sweet rice that has a bunch of different cool flavors in it. Our next dish is called fesenjun which is basically like a base of pomegranate paste with crushed up walnuts, turmeric, with chicken or beef, and also with rosebuds. And something I think is pretty cool about the difference between Iranian and US, Canadian, other cultural foods is that Iran uses a lot of plant-based uh, plant ingredients without making the plants the centerpiece of the dish. As you can see, the centerpiece of the dish in the picture is still like the protein of the meat, 
but you can see that it's still garnished with pomegranate seeds and that the pomegranate paste is going to add a lot of the flavor to this dish. Also, rosebuds are a thing that I've seen not a lot of people use in U.S. culture. And I think it's really cool that Iranian culture has a lot of unique ingredients in it. Uh, Fis and Jun can be made to be sweet, sour, or both. It's also pretty important to Yadonai, which is a special celebration. It's also considered to be like a quote-unquote rich person dish because of like an old Persian saying. But nowadays, it can be considered a rich person dish because of the current price of pomegranates and walnuts. Do you want to share with us the saying? Uh, I don't remember actually quite what it is. And if I remembered, um, I wouldn't really be able to pronounce it because classical Persian is quite difficult to pronounce for me specifically. So I got maybe next time. Pomegranate seed right on the top. Yes, there are. <laughs> Uh, our next dish is called qurma sabzi, which is basically the centerpiece of the dish is beef or lamb. And judging by like the green color of the dish, you could tell you can tell just visually that there's a bunch of herbs in it. But there's actually so many herbs in it. It's kind of unbelievable that you can just boil it down to like a simple bowl of stew. So basically, you can use any herbs for it as long as they're like a dark green color. But as far as I'm aware. Fenugreek is basically a must in every version of Gorma Sabzi I have ever seen. I don't know quite why. I guess it's just something about the flavor. Uh, there's also a bunch of beans in this dish, as you can see in the picture. There's onions, there's dried limes, which you can see at roughly the center of the dish. And it's often served with rice. Uh, there's also many, like absolutely so many versions of this dish. Basically, every family has its own version of like combination of herbs, specific type of bean, a uh, specific cut of meat or whatever. And it's just generally a very like, it has a lot of variety to it. No plate of Gorma Sabzi that I've eaten anywhere has tasted the same twice, basically. It's also pretty cool because there's like a saying that you say when like food tastes good, that like it means like, it tastes like my mom's korma sabzi, which is supposed to be a play on like how Iranian mothers are generally like cooking pretty good food. So thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed our presentation. And now I think we'll be opening the door to any questions. Yeah, um, thank you very much, Malika, for that great um presentation i enjoyed it very much and i'm pretty sure everyone else enjoyed it very much so now we move on to the questions that answers part or section of this uh symposium but before we start any questions i would like to i would like for you guys to turn on your cameras and scan these QR codes so you can keep be better connected with global youth philanthropy and the intercultural symposium in general And also, before we ask any questions, just a quick reminder to keep the questions non-political and like appropriate and polite out of the respect for the presenter. And now moving on, we have our first question in the chat and it says, I don't even know how to pronounce that, but what is Zoroastrianism? And I remember you talking about it in the presentation. Yeah, so Zoroastrianism is like, it's an ancient religion that's become pretty minor over the course of like a lot of years, but it still exists to this day, which I think is really cool. It's basically like any other religion. It believes in like, like absolutely central to Zoroastrianism is the difference between good and evil. And instead of like the popular belief of like all the different kinds of gods, Zoroastrianism has a specific god named Ahura Mazda, which is basically the central god that's like considered to have made the world. And it's pretty cool because a lot of, basically the ancient Achaemenid empire, not exclusively, but that was their major religion. So in a lot of the ancient scripts, you'll find like leaders referring to Ahura Mazda as, Ahura Mazda gave me the permission to do this, or uh, Ahura Mazda like allowed me to do this and gave me the strength to do this. So it's basically just like any other religion 
uh, with a little bit of difference to it, which I think is really cool. All right, and add a question of my own, actually. I think you talked about it in the presentation, but what is your favorite food or like tourist attraction that you went over in the presentation and why? For my favorite food, I'm definitely going to have to say forma sabzi because it's such a unique dish. Every time I taste it, it has a different like aftertaste or flavor to it. Like it's just so absolutely interesting to me how the same dish but with the same name can taste like so many different things every like every time you eat it. And for my favorite tourist attraction in this presentation that I went over, I'm going to have to say the Parque Abotash because I've been there ever since I was like a little kid. And I just have really fond memories of running through the water sprinklers and watching the fire towers go off and uh, going to the Porata Biat, which is right next to it, which I think is just, which I think just has to make it my favorite tourist attraction. Oh, also, if anyone, like for the people watching, if you have any questions and you're like shy to like unmute, feel free to type them in the chat and I'll just read them out for you. While we're waiting for that, Malika, I've got a question. I've got a couple of questions for you. So I was wondering, what would be the biggest challenge if an English speaker wanted to learn Persian? It's not enough to say English is a super vowel based language, while Persian, while it's also like super vowel based, a lot of the consonants are really hard to pronounce, like the consonant for a k, which is like a back, like uvular sound, which a lot of I think is unique to like Middle Eastern or uh, West Asian languages. Uh, so a lot of like non-native speakers have a lot of trouble pronouncing this consonant. Um, there's also like the consonant for like h, which I know is like it's not that difficult to say, but not a lot of English speakers are used to making like the sound for it. And also, I don't think the grammar will be too much of an issue considering the absolute atrocity that is English, the English language and English grammar and like tenses and stuff. But generally, I just think consonants and like pronunciation would be the most difficult thing for an English speaker. Ooh, follow up question. What do you think about the different writing script? Because I know that Persian doesn't use like the same letters that English does. I think it's definitely pretty cool. Uh, I believe the English language has like 26 or 28 letters. Well, I believe the Persian alphabet has roughly 32, which just represents like the like the number of different like vowels and stuff. Also, simply because Persian has vowels or like letters for like sounds in English that are uh, made with two letters like sh, which in English is usually spelled sh, but in Persian it's just one singular letter. Um, in general, I think it's pretty cool because English has a lot of different like writing styles and the way you write it, like cursive, print, and a bunch of other stuff. And Persian also has like, um, what's it called? Like fancy ways to write it, like calligraphy and stuff, which in general, I think it's also interesting how English is left to right while Persian is right to left. So. I believe it's like a nice difference in that it's a nice break from like the English language and how it works. And I just think overall, it's really nice to see a difference and such a variety in different languages. And we got some questions in the chat, which, uh, so Michael Wang said, can you tell us a little bit about Iranian arts and is it mostly religious? Iranian art, well, art as a term is super broad. It can refer to visual arts, architecture, music. Uh, in general, Iranian art does have a lot of religious influences in that you'll find songs everywhere that uh, refer to Islam 
or um, you'll find architecture in like uh, mosques and stuff that's specifically structured to be like religious and a bunch of art is religious, but not all of it is. As in like, there's a lot of art you will find that does have religious influences, but there's also a lot that you'd find that's just art for the sake of seeing it, for the sake of creative expression. Similarly to how US art works, sometimes you'll see art with like Jesus in it, or sometimes you'll see art with um, another prophet in it or whatever. But there's also a lot of art in the US that's just specifically for creative expression. And it's space, it's similar to um, it's similar to Iran in that not all of it is, but some of it is, and it's a nice difference between the two. And also I had another question. Since uh, you guys were talking about like languages, and I heard you are learning Mandarin. So what is like the hardest or, or like what is the biggest difference between um, Iranian languages and like Mandarin? Definitely like the most major, most obvious difference between the two is that well, Persian has an alphabet system while Mandarin has a character system. But I guess another major difference is in tones in Mandarin because Persian, while it does have tones, the tones are not the same as Mandarin in that Persian tones specifically refer to like the vowel sound that comes after a consonant, like ha, he, ho. All of those are like the different like quote unquote tones. While in Mandarin, there's like the rising tone, the dipping tone, the um getting lower tone. I don't know the uh the proper term for it, and like the long tone. And in general, I feel like pronunciation is the most major difference, but also writing is in that Chinese characters are pictographs, while Persian is just an alphabet system. So I think those are the most major differences between the two languages. Okay, and we have a few questions in the chat. So, um, my bad. So what is the best season to visit Iran? Iran is a, is a country with truly the four seasons. Like in the US, the seasons are like, Pretty long spring, decently long fall, uh, decently long winter, and like two weeks of like true hot summer. While in Iran, the seasons are truly like three months at a time. There's three months of winter, three months of spring, three months of summer, and three months of winter. Uh, if you want to visit, like in different areas of Tehran, the weather is different in different seasons. Like northern Iran, uh, gets a lot of snow, like basically like northern the U.S. It gets a bunch of snow in the winter, uh, while in the summer, southern Iran gets like super, super hot. Like all of it gets hot, but southern Iran is like unbearable. So in my opinion, the best season to visit Iran would be spring or fall, uh, generally because they're the most mild seasons. Um, also because generally the weather is more stable here around them. Uh, like the weather, the, t the heat is bearable because in the summer, the heat is absolutely unbearable. It's been so hot here. I've been sweating basically all day, every day. And, but in winter, it also gets like super cold. So I feel like the most comfortable season here would be spring or fall. And, uh, I would guess then would be the best time to visit if, uh, if you have time. yeah i also had a question of my own that i always like want to ask and sorry for like my ignorance right but is it more like acceptable or like correct to pronounce it iran or iran because i've heard like people like say both i mean if you went up to an iranian person and you and you said like are you iranian they wouldn't take offense to it so there is no like the correct way quote unquote to say it as in the way you pronounce it in the iranian language is iran uh, but in the English version of it, a lot of people pronounce it Iran just because of the way the English language works. So technically, it depends on like the language you're speaking to them to in like um, in would be the quote unquote correct way. But it wouldn't upset an Iranian person to call their country Iran. They'd just be like, oh, yeah, it's pretty cool here. But they'd still pronounce it Iran. 
So there's the correct way depends on the language. Like every language has its own ways of saying different countries. Uh, I know like a cool, like as an example, in English, you would call Indonesia, Indonesia, but in Persian, you call it Andonesia. So it, both of them are correct, but for their like respective languages. So there is no correct way to say it. It just depends on the language you're speaking in. But in Iranian, which is the language of here, the correct way to say it is Iran, but no one would get upset at you if you called it like Iran or like another way of saying Iran in like a different accent or whatever. Thank you. Um, while we wait for more questions to like pop up in the chat, Kiran, do you have any questions of your own? Sure. Well, on the topic of names, Malika, could you tell us about your own name and does it have any like meanings behind it? That's a pretty interesting question because while well, my first name, Malika, is derived from an Arabic word, actually. It's derived from the Arabic word Malik, which means like a ruler or like specifically a queen. But last names just depend on like since there are last names and last names generally like names in general have questionable meanings like they're pretty up to interpretation uh as far as i know my last name doesn't specifically have like a meaning but the, uh, malika mustafavi isn't actually like my full name my full name is sayde malika shayat mustafavi and i know sayde it's, it's like a title, not in like a, like a title, like, a, like king blank, like you'd call like a king, but more like a, it's like a title that you use when you refer to like descendants of prophets in the Islamic um, religion. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly. I forget which like prophet I'm supposed to be like descended from or whatever. But generally, Sayyidah is like a term that means like descendant of some prophet, and you'd have to ask the person what prophet. Uh, but yeah, Sayyidah means like descendant of a prophet, Melika means like queen or whatever. I'm not sure if Shariat has any meaning. I've never asked about that about my parents or to my parents. And I'm not sure if Mustafa B has any meaning. As far as I know, it's just the last name. So yeah. Well, that's very interesting. Um, all right, another question. So I know that you're in Iran right now. So what do you think so far has been like the most interesting or fun thing about your trip? Definitely, this is up to like personal like interpretation, of course, or like personal preference, but I'm like a huge cat lover. So like the best part of being here is just going out to the street and seeing like 50 different cats walking the street and it's just pretty cool. Uh, also, a bunch of uh, fun stuff here is that the food is, like, really good. Like, we went over a bunch of foods. Every section of Iran has, like, its own, like, unique foods and, like, unique ways of creating foods. Uh, but everywhere you go, the food is just super good. And I think that's really cool. Oh, also, I had a question of my own. When I was listening to your presentation about the straight cats, right? I had a question. Um... If there's a lot of straight cats, does that mean you guys don't see like any mice at all? Or is it like not Actually, very common? Yeah, mice do occasionally appear sometimes, but generally compared to like the uh where I live in the US, where I've seen quite a lot of mice over the course of a few years, um here there are minimal mice. In my time being here, which I guess isn't the most like take my word with a grain of salt because I only come here for like the summers to stay and visit my family but over the times I've been here I've never actually seen like a live mouse which I have in the U.S. several times so I guess yeah on the streets there's minimal mice uh, I guess in the houses there's no need for mouse traps so I guess there are no mice or we like minimal bring, we should bring straight cats to New York Anyways, there's another question. Cool. Yeah, yeah, there's another question in the chat. Um, how is the high school student life there? How many hours do they stay in school? And just an extension of that I want to add, and what type of subjects do they learn? Generally, US education and Iranian education are pretty similar. However, one of like the most major differences here is that in Iran, uh women and men or like girls and boys 
they have separated like classes and sometimes even like separated schools. So sometimes like barely ever uh, below high school will you or like below college uh, will you you will never basically ever see a class where girls and boys are like learning together. It's basically just it's just separated like that. I don't quite know why. I might have to ask about that later. But uh, that's like the most major difference. Otherwise, the high school students' life here, as far as I know, it's basically the same as the US and the subjects they learn are also the same. I know um, math is the same. Uh, a difference here is that uh, basically every student is not forced to, but one of like the required classes here to learn over the course of elementary and high school is Arabic. So every student here will have at least like a basic grasp of Arabic if they're not like good at languages. Another major difference is that while in the US there's a lot of options for like the modern languages you get to learn in schools, like I know in my school, you can learn like German, Italian, Spanish, French, Mandarin. Uh, here in Iran, uh, basically, as far as I know, the only two options here are Mandarin and Russian, which I think that's a pretty interesting uh, difference. Uh, as for how many hours they stay in school, I since I haven't personally gone to like a high school here and that like my family generally doesn't like go into that much detail about like high school life. Uh, I would assume it's the same or at least similar to the U.S. and that it's about eight hours, like from like, I don't know, eight to like 2.30 or whatever. But in general, it's pretty similar to the U.S. while it does have its own differences. So in your answer, you talked a little bit about Arabic. So I was wondering, like, what is like the relationship between Arabic and Persian? And like, maybe why are there kind of two languages being used? I'm not really sure like how and why Arabic and Persian separated into their own different languages. But uh, I'm sure as quite a lot of people know, Arabic and Persian use the same alphabet, but Arabic has four less consonants than Persian does. So Persian has four extra letters in that Persian has 32, um, uh, Arabic has 28. Uh, I'll just talk about like the major differences between the two since I don't really know how to answer your question and that like why they're different. But how they're different is that, well, Arabic has like a lot of emphasis on its consonants. And while, um, while Persian also has emphasis on its consonants, um, per, uh, Persian generally has a lot more focus on its vowels and a lot of consonants in Persian are generally like some of them are pronounced pretty similarly just because vowels are a lot more important to the language so i think that's like the biggest difference between the two also i don't know the question about stray cats <laughs> uh, i like cats a lot um do they have animal refugees for cats um, i'm too sure about that actually like i've never seen any on the streets but I do know that a lot of people here in Iran, while they don't like officially take the cats in to like keep them in their houses and stuff, uh, a lot of people do like occasionally set out like a bowl of like, I don't know, like tuna or like beef or whatever, and just like feed the cats. And as a result, the cats will generally like hang out at the person's house a lot or like find like a place to like, quote unquote, live near the person's house. And every day they'll come get food from that person. Uh, so as far as I know, there aren't like any official ones. There might be, but I'm not too sure. Okay, and since we are on time, we might go a little bit over time. So I understand if you guys have to leave, but there's still more questions in the chat that if you want to see the answers to, feel more to uh, feel more than free to stay. So Tom said, how is the cost of living compared to the U.S.? general the cost of living compared to the u.s is pretty similar if i had to guess it's well it depends on your like world view because if you're like a person from the u.s coming to iran to like live for like let's say like a year or whatever well since i i would assume you were raised with the perception of like or the currency of the u.s dollar 
when you come here and you're introduced to like the Iranian currency of rial and toman, uh, it's quite interesting because due to inflation, uh, the U.S. dollar has become over the course of time more and more like worth more and more uh, Iranian uh, money, like more toman. Like I remember back in like 2007-ish or whatever, super old, like a long time ago, uh, one U.S. dollar was only worth like 4,000 uh, Iranian toman. But now, like current day, it's almost 50,000. So because of inflation, it's increased quite a bit. So living in Iran is definitely, the being a native and living in Iran, your worldview about it would be that uh, the cost of living is pretty expensive and it's going to get more expensive because of inflation. But if you're from the US and you're coming here to like live for a little bit, you come here with like the perception of one US dollar is 50,000 toman and you're like, wow, everything is so cheap here. Like one plate of food is like the equivalent of like two or three US dollars. And so as a as an American person, you'd have a different view about it. You'd be like, the cost of living here is so cheap. But as an Iranian person, as a native living here for like the entirety of your life, it's been getting more expensive and it will keep getting more expensive if inflation doesn't like fix itself. I right, thank you for that answer. Uh, is there any more questions in the chat or like in general? All right, I know we've been like going for a long time, but I just I just need to know, do you have a cat in Iran? Like in your house, do you own a cat? Unfortunately, a lot of my family here, they're either allergic to cats or super sensitive to like pet hair. So in Iran, no, we don't have a cat. Neither do we in the U.S. because my mother is allergic and well, she lives with us in the U.S. So generally here, the most like common pet you'll find is like fish. You'll just find like a little fish in a bowl sitting there. Uh, some people have cats, but personally, I don't have a cat, mostly because my family is allergic. But I do know a lot of people have cats as pets. And it's just because my family's allergic and my mother is definitely afraid of cats that we don't have a cat as a pet. Okay, thank you very much. Seeing that we're already like four minutes over time, Mika, it has been an honor to share this platform with you. I certainly learned a lot and I'm pretty sure everyone else in the presentation appreciates and also learn a lot about e e e Iranian culture, my apologies. Anyways, yeah, thank you very much. We won't keep you any longer. And if you have any questions, um, like I said, feel, scan the QR code to follow our WeChat and so we can, be better connected but other than that um yeah other than that feel free to go but if you have any more questions stay in the presentation and we i'm sure we can answer some questions for you but other than that thank you very much for coming and i hope you guys have a good day see ya Like, do you mind staying for like five more minutes to answer any questions, if there's any? That's all night, believe okay. me. Okay. So yeah, um, for those of you still here, I, I take it that you guys have questions? Because if not, you guys uh, are free to go. I shall stop recording right now.